So, uh, so the format of this uh, forum uh, is uh, there will be three rounds of uh, questioning where I will ask, ask the first two rounds and then we are going to open up the forum for our, for our participants on the floor to ask questions. So by the second round, I would uh, get the uh, secretary to flash the QR code for you to ask questions. So we are going to uh, use Slido to ask the question. And the forum title, uh, as you can see uh, up there, is ODL and Microcredential as the Future of Education. And the question that we are asking is, will it work? Okay. So the format of the forum, to just uh, tell uh, everyone, is uh, I will ask the question and then uh, you will have about five minutes to respond uh, to the question and I would encourage other panels to also add on to the uh, the other panels discussion, discussions if they have uh, their own ideas or their, their own take on that and uh, after the round three where we get our participants to ask questions we would like to hear a summary of the topic within the context of um, of this, this question by, by our panel <laughs> Okay, so, uh, uh, following on from uh, Dr. Nobiha's keynote speech uh, this morning, so I'm, I would like to ask something about the future proofing of uh, education. Uh, so, if some of you remember, I did submit or uh, publish an article on, on, on the news about uh, how we, uh, how students can sort of shorten their uh, course time with uh, my, my credential or, or MC. So, uh, to follow on from that uh, news article also uh, from uh, Dr. Bihar's speech this morning, uh, my question is how uh, can ODL offering a program to uh, design to be designed uh, to adapt and integrate the new emerging learning technologies, uh, things like uh, AR and VR and AI powered, so that then uh, the micro credentials and ODL is uh, relevant and also uh, appropriate for the future job market. So, Dr. Bia, Dr. Bia. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Zahir, for your question. Um, I may um, approach this question from a different point of view. In my opinion, um, a sustainable ODL program or a sustainable uh, microfinancial courses doesn't necessarily need um, advanced technology integration, such as VR or AR. It can be uh, a very successful and sustainable course, uh, provided that the content is relevant, uh, the content is in demand and the way we assess and design the content is um, very relevant to what the students need, which I think I, I did iterate that uh, in the morning. And um, I think to make um, an ODL program um, sustainable, uh, it is very important for us to first um, review uh, the, the policies that we have in our institution and the way we offer our programs. This can be as simple as the uh, payment scheme. No, not payment scheme. The fees. The way um, our business model in in um, in putting the fees to our program. As simple as that. Um, in my experience, um, when we offer an ODL program or micro credential course, um, we often have this problem that um, how how much should we put it as a fee and how flexible can we be in um, having a, a fee scheme, uh, a payment scheme for, for our students and in fact for our lecturers when we design the payment scheme. Uh, and because like uh, a, a university like UTM, which is a very old university, in which we have a very um, um, old system in which that everyone is so used to that a system in which um, when we want to introduce something new, something like flexible payment, 
things like that, it becomes very complicated and complex, and it is very time consuming uh, for us to execute uh, at, at university level. Uh, so, in my point of view, to have a sustainable ODL, a sustainable micro credential, there are so many little things that we have to take care of, especially at administration level, to make things work. And I learned this from from one of uh, one of those uh, professors who, who initially uh, taught us that you know you have to run through the first whole cycle of the process to be able to identify which part is is missing. So um, so that then you know it will be more sustainable. Um, everyone uh, it is workable for a very long time. I think that's very important. Maybe it doesn't address your question in which how can we integrate. Uh, technologies because in my point of view it doesn't necessarily need uh, advanced technologies to make ODL program works or to make a uh, micro credential course uh, workable uh, in the future and relevant uh, in the future okay uh, an interesting answer but I think um, I do uh, agree with you uh, technology is there to support the, the, the learning and uh, what learners might be Concern with is actually how do we judge them, isn't it? Okay, so uh, thank you very much for, for the response. Uh, so now I move on to Dr. Zul. Uh, so I have the opportunity of looking through some of the audio courses that we design and develop uh, in in New Era, and more often than not, I cringe at uh, looking at some of the ODL resources that our lecturers in UM put up, which normally contains lecture slides that we use with our face-to-face -face student. So we just plop that in into our uh, ODL course. So um, how true is it, uh, Dr. Zul, uh, if I argue that self-instructional materials uh, very hard to be designed, uh, not to be just informative, uh, but it needs to engage and interact uh, with the learners. Okay, thank you, Dr. Uh, Zahid. Now, I think there is uh, one, uh, what we call it, stigma, I think, you know, that learning conventionally, you know, when you are meeting face to face with, with your instructors and also uh, studying online, it's basically the same. Now, when we look at any online courses, whether it's my credentials or ODL, the first thing that we need to, to start actually is to twist our mind first. Okay? That is very important. Why I, when I say like that? Because of if you have a mirror twin program, just like UTEP, okay, this I give the example of UTEP. UTEP actually we have exactly the same courses that run actually one as conventional, one actually run as ODL. Okay? Now, at the beginning of the process, they thought actually they are both similar. But actually they are not, because of they have two strap product permits. They are being accredited permits. So it means that when you look at the ODL, you cannot look that particular program or courses that you designed to be mirrored with the conventional. You start thinking of something else. This is where actually uh, you start talking about how do I engage this online content when actually the student not see me physically. And that's where actually this self-instructional material or self-directed learning comes in. So when you have those mind, then only you understand that when you learn by yourself, there is some sort of like engagement retention that actually you need to embed in the courses. How do you embed it? It doesn't mean like what Dr. Bia said, must use all these advanced but the way how you curate those content, how you create, there's two words that you need to go to. One is to create. Before you are able to curate, you need to create those content. Once you're able to create all these components, then you create a uh, curate. When you curate, that is where actually the instructional and ex user experience comes in. That is more important. So I hope I will answer part of that. I might not be able to, be able to answer in detail because of in UM, you also embedded a, a bit of culture, how actually you deliver the program, right? So, it, it's okay to embed those, but you have to, to know the distinction, uh, the, the, what the differences between your conventional and your uh, online program. Now, the other part is, some 
people believe they're actually putting a lot of engagement and also put a lot of interactive between you actually engage and also uh, attract the learners. No, right? That's different. Dr. Zahid just now mentioned about uh, in UM, some of the courses actually, you know, the text actually been taken up from a direct, from a normal uh, notes uh, session notes that actually you have information like that. No, actually you cannot do that. Uh, not, I say cannot, usually I don't advise you to do that. Because why? When you have a set of paragraphs that you show in front of the student from your PowerPoint note, you are elaborating. You have chance to elaborate, right? But once it becomes an information, information a text-based information that you put on online, you are actually have chances to elaborate. So that text must be able to elaborate itself. So it means that in terms of the sentence structure of those particular texts need to be rewrite, need to be revamped, need to be more persuasive, need to be more engaging. Engagement doesn't mean come from elements, but it comes from those sentence structure. So how are you doing it? Now there's, there are so many technologies available, you call it generative AI, that actually allows you to, that allow to help you actually to create this beautiful, persuasive, engaging, and more human than you actually in terms of persuasive people to write. Now, I give you one tips that actually you can use. For example, you want to tell, uh, you want to explain what definition of some term, for example. Usually what we do is, uh, micro, uh, microbiology is actually a study of this disease. That's a standard one. And then in the class, we explain to them. But when you want to put those paragraphs in text and it need to be self-directed in your scene, you have to re-choreograph those sentences, restructure and rewrite to make the philosophy behind of the uh, microbiology. And then you have to uh, elaborate in terms of what does it work, how does it work, or what does it, you know, in terms of those things. And you, you must elaborate in terms of the example actually about those microbiology and where it's applied and so on. So it slightly might be longer, but there is a tools that can do that in just five minutes. Right? And if you have time, you can see the after this, and I can show you that. Okay. Uh, ah, yeah. Um, Doctor Dewi, would you like to uh, elaborate on that, or Doctor Biha maybe? Because uh, I can see from your slides, Doctor Dewi, you have um, what seven or eight instructional designers in there. So how do they how do they work? How do you work on the content? We've got a template. We've got a template that we give to the to the course writers. So even if they have um, initially the the PDF where they've you know written their courses, they've got to transfer that onto the template. The template says that you've got to put it in a way where the the notes speaks like your instructor directly to you. It's written differently than you know like a, how a book is written or a module is written. So that is the specifics of a sim, right? So um, it's it's not easy for the faculty to do that. It takes a long time, even if you have your your, your initial uh, module ready, to transfer that and to make it uh, speaking out to you, to the learners, you know, from from the from the LMS. It's not easy at all. Good to be here. I think uh, in UTM we have uh, three methods, three approaches, and um, I think the one that uh, UTM did was amazing. Uh, but what we try to do in UTM is that uh, we have to make sure that this is this works and this immediately launch. Uh, so that was the initial intention. So we have these three approaches. First approach is to use a test and tell approach. Test and tell means that. Um, the lecturers have to um, immediately follow up an explanation with um, simple quizzes. So after you explain something, you have to put in some question. After you explain something, you have to put in some question. That is one approach that the lecturers can use. Another method is um, tutorial approach. So in this tutorial approach, um, we ask the lecturer what they should do is that um, they, should, uh, they can start with questions and then they elaborate. Start with question and then you elaborate. So, um, uh, because uh, we were thinking that if you want to talk to engineers, there are so many engineers in UTM, so maybe this is uh, they can better understand uh, these approaches. 
And then the third approach would be a reflective approach. So this is for people who wants to be more creative. So it's such a way that they um, arrange their uh, learning materials, um, for example, using problem-based learning approach or using other uh, teaching strategies that is more uh, that can engage students more actively. So the first and the second approaches uh, might be a little bit direct, but we have in mind uh, that our uh, prospective students are all mature students and they don't really, um, um, from what we understand is that it doesn't really matter whether what kind of things that they can click, as long as what matters to them is like these are the things that they can do. So that was our first phase in developing CDUDM. Uh, we have we started with pre ODL programs and that was our approach in developing C. Of course, we have the I we have our ideal ideas about what C might like the ones developed in UTEM, but unfortunately, at this moment we cannot make it happen. But we can make it happen maybe gradually after uh, all these three programs, uh, our all three ODL programs have better understanding what SIM looks like and they individually know why they need to change the way they arrange their materials. Okay, uh, thank you can, can I actually add just a yeah. little bit? Yes. Yeah. When I was sure. talking about templates, right? Um, the template, there are two types of template. A template for micro-credentials has, has got to be different, just like what uh, my colleagues here said. There is no, for your, if you're an IT, there is no chunking to be done for courses under micro credentials. Those are meant for micro learnings, just like micro credentials, meant for micro learnings. So it's a lot of the contents that are basically problem based, that's what you're saying, a lot of scenarios going on in there instead of uh, the usual kind of chunking that IT does. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so let's move on to the next question uh, to Dr. Dewi. Uh, so, um, I'm going to ask you uh, something about uh, developing uh, the educator uh, autonomy. So, uh, uh, because when when we heard the, the story that you had uh, just now, and I think we are in sort of the same boat here in, in, in UM. So, when to, to design self-directed self learning materials, especially for the educators, it can be challenging. So, and normally every team will have a leader. So, what strategies that uh, the lead or educator or the team leader can implement within their ODL design environment to help foster resilience and also uh, autonomy in their team when designing their learning contents? Okay. I think the most important, the ultimate thing is that you have to remember that you must build an ecology. Everything is symbiotic. You can't do anything in silo. It doesn't work like that, right? So if you're a content creator, you're a writer, you have to work with the designers, you have to work with the faculties, you have to work with the management, you have to work with the registry. Everything has got to be in sync. In terms of being autonomous learner, I'll just re relate to my own experience again. Um, I didn't want to um, learn how foreign university run their online programs. And so I registered, I enrolled into a master course from the University of Essex. Before the semester even started, they got me on, there's not even orientation yet. They got me on doing a submission for work. When they do this, they give me an actual assignment which is related to the masters that I was doing to answer that question. And in order to answer that question, they will look at how resourceful I am, how I'm able to use the tools that they provided, how I am at ease at navigating their platform, how I am able to understand things like plagiarism, if you know, assuming that you know I have not had any uh, uh, formal education before. You know, if you, have, if you use prior learning, right, you can just jump in doing your master's based on your work experiences. So all the assumptions with that, and then make sure that you're totally prepared, including hardware and software. They make you test and run, that everything goes on smoothly, and you'll be able to, at the end, submit that assignment. 
So then the orientation starts. And I thought that was fantastic. I'm not sure that there are any you know, IPTs in Malaysia are all do, already doing it. But I do know that we do have our regular orientations. And orientations can be so overwhelming, right? Uh, for a learner, because you have, you're just listening, it comes in, it goes out, until you need to do something and you don't know and you call for help, right? So that's one best practice and I wish and I hope to be able, you know, to, to share that with um, my colleagues uh, at the op operation side to help us with that. Number two is that you need a constant pastoral care. Whatever that you have in a conventional setting, you need to um, replicate that kind of uh, care. You know, so you have technology now, you can have a chat or I think something that is there available 24 seven because remote learners are learning at the time that they're able to learn. And that could be at, you know, odd hours, you know, midnight, uh, early morning, where, you, where the operations is not on yet. So, but you have to make it accessible to them so that they'll be able to um, address whatever complications that they have, right? So that, again, is also not, not being practiced so much yet. Uh, you have chat box, but they're sometimes not very helpful. So we have to look into that. Um, number three is that what we have um, in the department is we have an IXD, Interaction Experience Designer. This person looks into all the experiences of all types of users and makes sure that whatever challenges or questions that need to be addressed, it's uh, being addressed immediately. And what that person does is they uh, organize clinics. So whatever medications you need, you need, you know, all sorts of remedy, it comes out in the form of clinics. So, and clinics are all specific to the different types of users. So it also ties into the CRM, right? So whatever questions, it comes from multiple channels. The WhatsApp, the, the instant messaging and the LMS, the walk-ins, everything is being um, collected and then specifically customized the clinics that anyone needs. So that, I suppose, helps a learner to be very confident in learning independently. Um, but there's also another component, which is the collaborative learning or the constructive learning, which hardly takes place in ODL. And this is where a lot of learning actually happens when you learn from other people, right? Or other people complement or add on to what you know. So that feature or that module has to be present on your LMS for people to not need the facilitator, but to be able to um, organize within themselves, like when we have in a classroom, you know, outside of the classroom, they kind of meet somewhere, you know, after class we meet at Mama and all that, but that's where other kinds of learning happens. So we also need to replicate that to be able to then um, enable the learner to become autonomous. Okay, right. thank you very much. That's a uh, really good answer to that. So uh, I think uh, we are looking at uh, both ways for the team leader designing and also for uh, the learner experience as well. Um, and I think uh, we might be sort of um, uh, quite um, not there yet, especially the, the public universities with regards to that kind of um, service to our learners. Yeah, probably I can add a bit more uh, from Dave. Now, actually when, when you're talking about uh, MC or ODA program or any online program, uh, the, the way that actually we looking at the support system is actually you need to have both actually uh, kind of hybrid. Uh, the way how actually you tend to experience now what we do is actually within the elements itself we have what we call one stop center. That one stop center actually divided into three categories. One is actually the orientation we call it the orientation, a very basic orientation because of the student never uh, attended any physical or uh, they never seen how you tend looks like. So we have this what we call the orientations, we actually guided them uh, about the looks of our campus, where it's located, uh, even the facilities that we have, uh, any virtual facilities or any virtual machine because of in UTEM, uh, for the remote student, we allow them actually to 
go to the lab using what we call it remote uh, uh, virtual machine, where actually you can access the software uh, anywhere you want, but actually the, the software actually is connected into our lab. So in Utah, basically, our lab and some of the lab actually is 24 hours a day. You don't shut it down. Because to cater for this plan of this October OTM, where actually the students sometimes they do not have their own facilities to test uh, the, the, the simulations and all those. Because sometimes, right, certain software actually are license based. So the students are able to buy or to purchase. So we need to provide those through what we call a virtual machine. Which actually, then, the games on that, we have to ensure the student that, you know, this software actually is very likely. they be able to access because of, for example, right, if you have a student from Bangladesh, and if you have any experience here for a student from Bangladesh, if they're using a home broadband, uh, uh, broadband certain university in Malaysia will block those uh, AP. But they need to use their mobile uh, AP, you know, mobile devices. So, so we have to understand all those processes. So that's why in UTEM we embedded those one-stop center in our MLS. You'll be able to see that. The second one, actually, we have what we call it uh, uh, psychological support. This is where actually they will be able to, uh, to rectify, to diagnose, and also to remedy uh, any psychological, uh, uh, what we call it, illnesses that probably, you know, depression, they start having uh, uh, amnia uh, or all those. We have those uh, what step by step to remedy. But if those things cannot be remedied through those kind of online, uh, what we call it, uh, support, then actually we give them 24 hours uh, numbers that actually they will be able to call. Whether actually through normal call or actually through uh, what we call it, a chat room, that actually uh, there's somebody who uh, actually, it's a, what we call it's a half intelligent chatbot. Actually, if, if it depends on your keyword, so basically, if your keyword mesh with the database, then actually it will give you the answers straight away. But if those uh, chat actually <coughs> are able to do that, then you will be connected directly to the counselors. Those like the third one, actually, we have other sections, what we call it uh, eHealth, which actually we put in our LMS also. This eHealth function is exactly the same. You will be able to remedy any uh, life symptoms that you have, for example, like probably you have migraines or probably you have diarrhea and all those and then we give them a tips how actually to reduce or actually to minimize the impact. But if that cannot be done, then actually we give them a list of doctors available because in UTEM we have a certain where actually the doctor is on call 24 hours a day. So they actually they will be able to answer those uh, kind of things. So this is actually what we, we think long time ago as what Dr. Davis said, this basically sometimes is being neglected but actually, when you're looking at the MQA requirement from document and to society, if I'm mistaken, actually they mentioned about this already, that, that you must have that E1 stop centers and a support that you need to build. Because I remember when they came to UTEM, the first thing actually they want to look in our LMS is that one. They don't look at the system. They look at, do you have all these support personnel? Because of, you know, when, when you start bringing this into online, especially when you start creating this purely online, which I'm uh, open to outside the when the student actually is not, no longer exists as a physical student. The, the most important thing is not only the learning process that need to, to go through the journey, but the preparation of going through those online journey is actually more difficult. It's actually like mentally more, more challenging. Because of why? When you study at home, for example, after 8 o'clock, you know, you have kids, you know, mingle around with you, you have your wife with you, you know, there's a, 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 a bunch of food in front of or table, all this become you know, one of the things that actually you need to control you know, using all these kind of things. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So uh, please keep the questions uh, coming in. So and you can actually upload questions. So if you like the question, then the, the question will go up. So uh, I will normally prefer the, the questions that have been uh, uploaded. So uh, in the second round, I, will, I might not ask uh, all the questions that I have for panels. Um, but I wanted to uh, ask um, Dr. Zul, uh, although you just un un answered the, the question quite, quite long just now. Uh, so, uh, current research actually suggests that learning is heavily influenced by the context in which it takes place. So, how do you design the, the scene uh, so that it considers the environment uh, of the learner themselves. So things like uh, who are studying just now, we were talking about studying at home, uh, who are learning at their workplace or learning while they are in the, in the, uh, 
in, in the train or in the taxi? Okay, the first thing is that uh, the way how we design our scene actually, we, we don't put a limit in terms of how long actually you need to complete the courses. That's actually, if you look at our scene that is open, uh, now, why we do that at, at this stage, you know, we do not know later on how we're going to control that. Because, for example, right, some of the uh, micro-credential or ODL courses you see, it, they will open those courses quick like me, topic by topic. So you need to complete that and only you'll be able to see the next task to be completed. At the moment in UTEP, we don't do that because we believe that once uh, uh, the flexible learning actually being embedded into ODL and online learning, you should actually be, uh, be able to provide flexibility for the learner to learn. So, okay, just take this example right here. Probably topic one, it requires probably three hours to complete. But somehow, because of prior knowledge that they have, because they came in with a bit of help, for example, five years, uh, ten years ago, okay, experience, you should not actually restrict them, you know, to move to the next topic, even though the first topic requires four hours. But probably he can complete. So that's why we don't, uh, what we call it, we don't hide any notes or any uh, content structure. Uh, we want them to be flexible. At any given moment, actually, they also can come back to whatever uh, topic they want. That's, that's the first thing. The second one, actually, is that that's why uh, in, in uh, developing a scene, the first thing that we need to look at is actually, as I mentioned, just not in terms of this, what we call it, infrastructure. Now, a lot of us actually, uh, forgotten about this very first crucial element, infrastructure. When the student actually in remote, how do you know that actually their network, their internet is actually as good as you? How do you know? Right? So because of that, sometimes going to the, the, the smallest requirement of content in terms of uh, the, the load is very important. To test actually is, Go to the basic requirement first to engage with them because the more interactivity, the more videos you add in, the bigger simulation you put it in, the more loading times for this learner will go through. Now, what happened actually uh, in terms of their mental state at the time? When actually they loading things and those, you know, psychologically when you see those loading icon, if we go then five seconds, you will stop looking at it. Right? So then you actually ask them to stop learning. So that's where actually the what we call it, the personalization of SIP also must take into account of geolocation, infrastructure technologies that this learner will have, and also their uh, their ability actually to use those technologies. Some of them definitely, if you're talking about students from South Africa, for example, from the remote one, they, they might not have a proper equipment to, to what we call it to open those content. Especially content that actually requires a certain um, uh, video compressions or require a certain uh, graphic card. Now, this technical item of, of computer requirement never being discussed actually in the development of SIM, but actually when we're talking about uh, from the point of view of uh, in infrastructure development, that is the one that actually they will ask you first. Is your infrastructure will actually hinder, if these features will hinder the learner access to that? How long actually? That's, that's in come, come to the interaction experience design as well. How long actually certain video need to be loaded? How long actually this document need to be uploaded? All those considered as, as part of the experience that actually you need to look into the Okay, thank you very much. So I'm going to ask the next question to both uh, Dr. Biha and uh, Dr. Devi. Uh, and this is uh, got to do with um, the potential of pairing up uh, ODL uh, with micro credential. So, because uh, we can see in the future that uh, there will be requirement for constant upskilling and also adaptation uh, in terms of uh, how work is done in, in the future. So, uh, in your opinion, uh, first maybe uh, Dr. Bia can answer this from a, a perspective of public, uh, public institution and then uh, we would like to also get uh, Dr. Davis uh, Feedback on that. How do you uh, pair uh, an ODL program with uh, a micro credential so that then uh, you promote this, this, this ethos of uh, continuous learning uh, and also you help with the learners uh, with 
their adaptability in their job market, to, to drive in, the, in their job market? Uh, I think um, an example of the Excel playbook just now um, demonstrate to us that um, there are existing structure that we can look into, for example, the POI structure, in which you combine micro-credential uh, and then you can stack them to, at the end of the day, you earn a degree uh, out of the micro-learning experience that you have gone through. Um, however, the challenge is that um, our system currently uh, limits us from um, giving out a specific degree that is um, very specific based on personal choice of um, design. What I mean is that, for example, I have interest in um, microfinancial in science. In science. And then I have another microfinancial related to um, teaching and learning, which is education. I have I'm also interested in um, going through my credential in uh, something related to IT. So how all of this can add value for my uh, future work? So our system is currently not flexible enough to be able to allow our students to design their own curriculum, in which we are trying to have all sorts of um, initiative to break through this wall because um, for programs for example they have a program standard and for a certain program which do not have any specific program standard they, they also have uh, uh, MQA monitoring them so um, but I think um, in the future stacking combining this micro learning to be able to later on um, you earn a degree out of it um, is possible uh, and it can happen, but um, our system has to be creative enough and flexible enough um, to allow this to happen. And I have to add, for example, from all the facilities provided, for example, from UTEM, just, uh, they said just now, that they have this e-counseling help. And um, they have like, um, you know, uh, and all kinds of chatbots that can assist remote students. Our students also have to understand that these are the reasons why the fees for ODL should be higher than your conventional program. Because, you know, to establish all this kind of infrastructure, it's not that simple. To, to develop seed requires effort. So, the mindset of our future learners also have to change in such a way that you have to understand the reason why this program is very expensive is because of these facilities that we uh, give to you. Uh, which is we built them from scratch and it is not very easy to establish. So, and I have to say that you know our ODL program is UT, in UTM, the, the fees is higher than our conventional program. Uh, although they mirror each other, but it's uh, more expensive uh, when you study in ODM mode compared to conventional due to these um, reasons. And we have to educate our learners that these are the reasons we have to be more. Uh, for such mode of learning. Okay. Uh, Dr. David, so again, uh, how do you pair body uh, and micro credentials, especially uh, being from a private university, maybe you are more flexible or more agile in, in this area? Um, my personal opinion is that uh, micro credentials is not exclusive from ODL, it's part of ODL. Nature, the nature behind micro credentials is delivery um, in terms of ODL. But in terms of content-wise and in terms of the outcomes, um, it's, got, it's got to be different. Micro-credentials are meant for the present, for the now. So you've got to get a very large uh, industry participation to be able to develop something which is for micro-credentials. Otherwise, it's really no value. But my concern now is that when you have micro-credentials which are stackable, how long of a duration, how long a period would you allow for that stackable to happen? Because you're looking into very current needs, current skills, 
that may be obsolete in a year or two, even right now, with all the dynamics that's happening out there in technology, the environment, machinery, and all that intelligence. Um, when, when do you regard something, uh, a micro credential cost is obsolete? You have to think about that. Um, we've not had many dialogues about that. We've learned that this is something that we need to embark on, but we've not looked any further from whatever discussions that we've been currently having. Um, the other thing is that it's not only getting the industry, but it's also getting the professional uh, bodies to come in for micro-credentials. As you were saying, it should be valued at a higher price range because of the, the needs that the needs that uh, it's fulfilling right now, the current needs that it's fulfilling right now. So we are, in fact, the other way around. We're looking at, at something that we need to sell very cheap instead. <laughs> not cheaper, but very, very cheap in order to make it accessible to all. But skills should not be cheap. Skills is something that you really have to pay for to be able to get that value because skills is very, you know, it's customized to your needs and your work and, and um, your career. Number two is that it's got to be so flexible because if you have a learner, a learner or a student like me, I'm so icky and you know I, I want to learn a lot I started in shipping I went into business and management I went to organizational behavior I went to organizational uh, psychology I did psychology and then now I did facilities management and my masters in environmental economics and now I'm doing penology which is all about prisons and punishment if you have a learner like me who's really not settled in what I want out of life you have a personalized journey where you say make it flexible for you to offer micro credentials of something which is personalized to me. At the end of one year, I might have something which is not fulfilling my you know stackable um, qualification. You know, so we need to then look across the board, across the discipline, and I, I think it's a little bit tricky with our regulations right now to be able to do, you know to allow this kind of um, across the disciplines kind of uh, stacking. Yeah, thanks. All right, thank you very much. So uh, let's move on to the questions from the floor. So I I think that we've got a lot of questions uh, that ask about credit hours and MC. Uh, so, um, so let me try to sort of, uh, <coughs> summarize the, the different questions into, uh, so, uh, we now know that MC can be uh, stackable. Okay, so how many credit hours uh, would uh, the panel here uh, recommend uh, for uh, an MC? Uh, so in the same way, how how long is the MC cost should be? So um, anyone from the panel would like to answer probably uh, Dr. Bia first on the ministry side. Okay, um, for, from what I understand uh, from the existing guidelines that we have uh, in Malaysia right now related to micro-credential uh, for a micro-credential that, that has parent from academic program uh, in an institution uh, minimum your uh, micro-credential course uh, it can be as small as 40 hours of SLT of student learning time that, that's more for example if you have um, your uh, conventional course uh, is a three credit hour course that means you have uh, almost maybe 120 SLT so you can break that down um, into three smaller uh, micro credential courses in which every micro credential course uh, has um, 40, 40 hours of SLT however for standalone micro credential and UTEM demonstrated that they have eight hours of SLT for a micro credential course there is no wrong in that um, but um, I highly recommend that um, if you want to develop a, a very small uh, micro-credential courses, it should not be so small in such a way that you, when your student go out, you, you know, when they have ended the course, they end up knowing only, learning only the definition of microbiology, 
Does it make sense to you? You know, the, 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 the course is so small that you, at the end of the day, you, you only know what is the definition of microbiology, for example. So it has to be um, um, created or, or developed in such a way that at the end of the day, you learn at least one skill out of that microbiology process. So, of course, for a standalone microbiology, there is no limit to how minimal you can create your courses. It's up to you as a course developer. But you should develop that in such a way that someone there's a few takeaways from that course. That would be my point. Okay, so the next question from the floor, uh, I, I think would be suitable for Dr. Zul. So I'm combining a few questions here. Uh, so the, the question uh, talks about or try to uncover what would be the best way to deliver uh, technical and mathematical content in uh, an ODL that uh, so it asked about how do we then uh, write the scene for that okay uh, when we talk about the technical or uh, what we call it the psychomoto part of, of you know content where it requires the learner to actually doing things right uh, doing simulations or actually they're using certain software or actually they might be uh, even up to kalau dekat UTEM, in UTEM, even up to touching uh, equipment. Okay. So how are we doing it? Okay, if it's involved about uh, simulations of coding, then actually we embed it into uh, our LMS because our LMS is based on model. Now it also again depending on what engine you are using. Not all engine will support those. It will, the first thing that actually the uh, UM uh, developer must know. Then you have to ask the uh, e-learning center uh, in terms of your platform. Does your platform actually include the plugin, what we call it, uh, coding uh, simulation? In UTEP, we do that. So within the, the platform itself, we actually download the plugin. If you require, I can show you what, 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 uh, what the coding is. So the student will be able actually to simulate a certain code and the result will come out within that platform itself. So that's what we call it if you want to generate technical or practical approach in terms of just coding. Now, if it's involved about installing a software, which actually requires a certain software. Now, there's a standard industrial software that actually certain universities use. For example, CAT software. Okay. Or any probably um, uh, health services software. So because of that, what actually you can do, actually we go, the first stage actually we go is we go into open source software. We have a team that actually their job is every day to search an open source software. Then actually, why we need those? Actually, we want to replicate in terms of function. If the function is similar, but only the user experience slightly different, then we will put those software on top of the list that the developer, will, uh, sorry, the, the lecturer will be able to link those software to download into uh, their laptop or even the learner will be able to download without any license. So that's how actually we do that. Now, in terms of the content, how to create a scene that actually requires a certain uh, instructions actually for this uh, learner to learn, then step by step actually is still the best. The step by step can be developed through a text based, with image based step by step that actually they can they can follow. Now remember this: not all step by step can be in a video for video form. Why? If you have, for example, 45 minutes step by step uh, of uh, practical, using a video, your video will be more than 45 minutes. That is not practical because why? Remember, your LMS is actually on your uh, browser and then you also open the software in the same page or probably you can go to different multiple desktop. If you are using step by step, then it's easy for you to flip between desktop to, uh, to desktop on your laptop. But if you are using video, you have to pause, and then you do, and then after that, you forgot, you have to rewind the video, and you go back and do it again. So be careful when you do that. So my suggestion, even in UTEM, we we not encourage actually the lecturers using video to teach step by step of practical, uh, practical learning. So you must use step by step one, two, three, three, and four. I have actually a sample and also a template how to create step by step for, for that. 
So because why, even the step by step will, will take you longer. Now it depends on how actually your LMS will support. Some of them actually will sit within the LMS. Some of them actually you will be able to download those PDFs step by step. So it depends on how you do it. Some LMS actually you will be able to do a pop up. So the, the step by step will just come up pop up. So you're still within the LMS. So that is the best actually if you think uh, your courses actually do have practical component and requires step by step or requires software to do or requires simulation to do that. Now, the other one, the last one, we have this auto multi program. Auto multi program requires uh, the student to touch uh, engine. So they, they should be able to differentiate between V6 engine and V12 engine, for example. So, what we do actually, we give them a few scenarios. One scenario is we ask them a question. Do your parents own a car? So they have to answer that. If they yes, then we ask them to give open the hood, identify the engine, take a photo, what type of engine, how many pistons, and after that they will reply back to the instructor and upload. And then from that, then only we will give them a video shot. They actually tell them this is a V6 engine and this is the component. And also because of we have uh, what we call it the app student. So we, 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 we capitalize our final year students to model, 3D model all these engineering components and then we make them as an asset and later on what we do actually we supply this to our student learner, you know, Arab Saudi and all those to simulate that engine. That's how we do it. And if any of these methods mentioned by Dr. Zul doesn't work, I would tell my uh, lecturers, then uh, you cannot uh, offer your program online. Because uh, we are a firm believer of, you know, when you, when you choose the mode of delivery, uh, you think about what's best for the students. How can you best deliver the content to your students? To, and if any of the, this method doesn't seem to work, so, the best way would be face to face learning, and you do that. Don't do that in Odia. We've got um, in our team of uh, designers, we've got people who've got different abilities um, because our goal is to provide masses and masses of diversities. So, one of our principles is inclusivity. So, when we, when we run the prototyping, usability testing, and uh, user testing, we run it amongst ourselves. In our group, we've got one who's physically handicapped. So if you're looking into stress tests when you're navigating, this is all online, you know, how else then can you accommodate the needs of this person? We've got two persons who've got learning disabilities. I won't review them. <laughs> one is diagnosed learning disability. The other one is undiagnosed, but clearly has got some insufficiency of understanding um, instructions, for instance. We've run our courses and the, the way that we deliver, present online with all these people and try to appreciate the different needs of that. So again, and then find ways or find tools to be able to then supplement this. Actually, if you look at all the guidelines of my credential or ODF, even it's stated that actually if the program actually is based on practical-based program, actually they discourage you to convert this program or courses into micro at this stage. Alright, so I know the, the secretary is going to stand on my head uh, for continuing a little bit more, so uh, let me steal uh, five to seven minutes. Uh, so I think this is an important question to be asked. Uh, how do you design out cheating or plagiarism uh, for assessments in uh, ODL and also micro how you use it in? <laughs> Even can detect AI. Other ways? We uh, we try to encourage uh, educators to use uh, creative ways of assessing. For example, uh, record demonstration, uh, um, create portfolios, um, and um, ask them to produce something. So uh, rather than um, but of course, there are there are for certain content that you cannot um, you know deviate from the way you assess them traditionally. But uh, we did encourage uh, our staff to, to do 
many creative ways of assessing students. And uh, in fact, uh, if you are mirroring your ODL program from um, uh, from academic program that has been accredited by MQE, it doesn't limit you from changing the way you assess your student as long as it is aligned with the CLOs uh, and it is measuring the same thing that you're supposed to measure in the traditional, in the conventional program. So for example, if in your uh, conventional program you uh, assess them uh, using uh, final examination, traditional paper and pencil uh, examination, you can change the way you assess them in an ODL program. Um, however, it has to also measure the same CLO uh, as indicated the one in the uh, in the conventional program. Yeah, I've, okay. This is from my experience. Now, I'm assisting actually KPJUC to develop this nursing program to become ODL. Now, this, uh, and they go for 100% except the clinical part. So actually, they asked me this question. How actually uh, to assess? Because when you are in nursing, uh, you, there's a day that actually you need to go to the ward. When they go to the ward, actually they have this wrong. Right? So how actually they said when, when you know, uh, because of the, sorry, uh, the clinical part actually they've done it at the end of the semester. So, so they probably revamp the structure of the, the nursing program. So the first few years actually all is okay. But within that online, there's still certain assessment that actually usually they do in terms of uh, doing a report. Uh, they also do uh, logging, they call it uh, book logging. And after that, they also actually uh, take pictures and videos uh, regarding about uh, activity they do. For example, like uh, checking the high blood pressure, uh, sorry, the thermostat, uh, uh, all those kind of machines. So what actually we suggested by that time when, we, when they're designing those actually in terms of how do you do the, the thing, we, we sort of like a tune back the mindset of there should not be a lot of written assessment, but rather more into visual assessment that actually also can be the same way as the written assessment. One of the uh, one of the suggestions yeah, at that time from uh, from our panel and also from from us is that so those logbook that you need to write, we change those logbook to become what we call it a, a recording logbook. So from those recording logs, actually it's difficult for them to achieve because of you need to go to that the location and you need to be on record video, not photo, because photo also can be cheated nowadays. You can take the photo yesterday and then you can record it today. So every day what they do actually, because every day they need to do the logo. So what they do actually, you cannot take a photo in the same place every day. So you have to go. So that's how actually they control those kind of things. So the video assessment actually requires the presence of your face with the reflections rather than just a written uh, assessment. That is how it is about the video. Okay, so um, I'm thinking that uh, you can probably in the future use TikTok to do that. Yeah, yeah it is <laughs> Okay, so uh, I think uh, that concludes our uh, session with our uh, panel. I think uh, please uh, give them a round of applause.